What is buckling? Buckling is another type of structural instability where a structure undergoes rapid sideward deformation. Imagine crushing a soda can. That is a very simple example for buckling. Buckling usually occurs when the structure is subjected to compressive loads, but it may happen under tensile loads too. A good example for this is called as the sun kink that occurs in rail tracks in very hot weathers due to thermal expansion. When buckling happens, the structure loses its stiffness and therefore loses its load bearing capacity to an extent. If the structure loses stiffness in a small portion of the model such that it loses load bearing capacity momentarily but regains it afterwards, such buckling is called as local buckling. While buckling is generally considered as a structural failure, the local buckling is not always a total failure and may even be integrated into design process. Unlike dynamic instabilities, buckling is usually not due to the inertial effects. In fact, it is due to a sudden change of potential energy of the system into kinetic energy. So, having some form of dissipation mechanism may not be very helpful in resolving such instability. Also, in most cases, the point of interest is usually the maximum load at which the structure buckles and not studying how the system behaves during and post buckling. So, in general, the starting point of governing equation includes just the stiffness term. So, a static analysis is a good starting point. To understand the challenges in solving for buckling, let's study the buckling of a simple load-bearing column. Let's say the column is fixed in the bottom and it's subjected to compressive load from the top that acts along the axis of the column. At some point, the column fails to bear the load and buckles. The critical load at which this structure buckles is called as the limiting point. So the column rapidly deforms sideways at this point. But which side? Is it the left side or the right side? Due to the symmetry, there is no one direction that's preferred. So there is no unique solution to this problem. Due to such non-unique solution situation, solving for this critical load requires special methods. Also, due to this non-unique nature, this point is also called as the bifurcation point. Even when there is no symmetry and if a side is physically preferred, there are still some issues pertaining with solving for such systems. To understand them, let's look at the force displacement curve for a typical system that buckles. Usually, a monotonously increasing force with displacement is seen at the start. The slope of this curve is nothing but the stiffness of the structure. At the onset of buckling, there is loss of stiffness followed by a rapid drop to negative stiffness. This means that there is hardly any resistance offered to deformation. After a while, the support may regain its stiffness and continue to counter the load. But at the onset of buckling, there is a force imbalance. So the governing equation at this point takes this form. As we can see, the stiffness drops to zero and there is no numerical solution to this problem. This is the key issue with performing a static analysis of buckling structure. So, it's clear that buckling needs special methods for solving. There are three ways of solving for buckling in structures. Linear buckling analysis, which uses eigenvalue analysis. Nonlinear buckling analysis, 
which uses a static analysis and a nonlinear transient analysis. Depending on the application and the objective of the study, one or more of these three methods is usually chosen. Let's study the first method, which uses eigenvalue analysis. As mentioned earlier, in most cases, the interest of study is to solve for the critical load at which the structure buckles, and what happens to it afterwards is not of relevance. So, at the onset of buckling, we may consider that the system loses stiffness. If we introduce a small change in stiffness as a factor in the governing equation, it takes this form. As you can see, this takes the form of an eigenvalue problem. Once solved, the outcome of this analysis is the load multiplier lambda i and the corresponding mode shapes psi i. To solve this, first a static analysis is performed with the nominal load applied to the structure. Then the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are solved for. The eigenvalues are the multiplying factors which when multiplied by the applied load gives us the critical load at which the structure buckles. And the corresponding eigenvector tells us in what direction the structure buckles for that multiplying factor. Going back to the column example, an eigenvalue provides the buckling shapes psi1 and psi2 and the load multiplying factors lambda1 and lambda2. So at a load of lambda1 times f, the structure buckles in the shape of psi1 and at a load of lambda2 times f, the structure buckles in direction lambda2. In this case, due to symmetry, the values of lambda1 and lambda2 are equal. So the eigenvalue analysis predicts all possible modes of buckling at the buckling load. And since we are not interested in knowing the structure's behavior beyond this bifurcation point, we will not run into force imbalance issues either. This way, an eigenvalue analysis helps us in performing a buckling analysis of structure. While it sounds very promising, the eigenvalue analysis does have some shortcomings. First of all, it's a linear analysis, so it does not take into account the non-linearities. So it uses linear elastic material behavior, it uses small deformation theory, and all other non-linearities such as contacts are idealized. Also, it reduces the force displacement curve up to bifurcation point to be linear. As a result, the buckling load predicted is usually a conservative estimate. But this is usually a computationally cost-effective analysis. So it gives a very reasonable estimate of the buckling load. Now coming to the second method, which is a nonlinear buckling analysis. Let's rewind to the governing equation of a static analysis. As discussed earlier, at the onset of buckling, the reaction force drops nearly to zero and the applied load is not balanced. As a result, a numerical solution for such system using the Newton-Napson method fails to converge. This point of divergence will be used as a way of gauging the point of buckling. The applied load is incremented to the point where the solution starts diverging and this load is nothing but the buckling load. This is a nonlinear analysis and it uses the large set formation theory, can use material and contact nonlinearities. So the buckling load estimated from this method is more accurate compared to a linear buckling analysis. Also, this method can be used for predicting both the local and overall buckling too. 
Typically, one can first perform a linear buckling analysis to get an estimate of the buckling load and then perform a following nonlinear analysis with this buckling load estimate to fine tune the value for an accurate estimate. So why is there a need for a transient analysis? If there is interest in studying the system's response both during and beyond the buckling too, then we will need special methods to push the solution past the bifurcation point. There are some special methods that may help even a static analysis in pushing past this point. But in these cases, a transient analysis can also be useful since it uses the full governing equations including the inertial terms and hence can account for the velocities and accelerations of the points.